How's it going everyone? Session here. Welcome to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre game. I wanted to do a bit of an early review just talking about the game in its entirety after playing it for some time, reaching level 20. Uh, I've been able to play about close to 100 games and just really wanted to go in depth about how do I feel about the game playing it from both sides as well as everything the game has to offer. Starting with the customization side of things, you obviously have yourself five victim members you can play and five family members you can play and they each have their own stats and they each have their own abilities and they have perks that they can share across the board on one side versus the other. So with the victims, you have yourself toughness, endurance, strength, proficiency, stealth, toughness being health, endurance being your ability of running distances and also for how long. Strength is your ability to perform tasks that require strength and also even combating against the family members. Proficiency is how well you can perform tasks that are around the map and then stealth is how quietly you can perform said tasks. Every single character has their own particular build, if you will, of those stats that really showcase what they're designed to be used for. And the same thing goes for the family side where they have savagery, blood harvesting, and endurance. Savagery is the melee damage that can be performed by the family, and it is in total across the board. So, you know, depending on how you build out your family, the build kind of works congruently across the board for all characters that are there. Whereas for the victims, their builds are individualized per person. So each person has their own way of being able to build a, a certain method to the madness for how they want to go up against the victims. Blood harvesting is the combination of being able to find blood pools that are scattered throughout the map that they can pick up and they use that to feed the grandpa. Some of them can also be used for activating and utilizing certain perks and endurance is the run speed if you will for their ability to run distances and also the speed so it kind of it works the same way for the victim side as well now going into the loadout section you know you can actually get a really good detail about what all these stats and abilities come into play per person so checking at the victim side you know looking at connie she has the ability to open a door almost instantaneously but then her stamina basically gets cut in half also, anything that she does noise-wise is cut in half also, so she's much louder while she's affected by this buff. Each character has their own abilities, and they really put a loud emphasis on skill trees and modifications for perks and abilities that all the characters can utilize. Because you'll see here that with the ability, as you use the character, you get rewarded for playing the character and you can actually increase the effectiveness of said ability, whether it's decreasing stamina cost or basically having a sort of debuff time when you actually utilize the ability. Sometimes there's no stamina cost at all. And there is like that level three rate, which ends up being kind of the strongest level that you can utilize it for. And you also have this ability to respect the points, which will pretty much let you re you take back all the points that you put in towards the tree, and then you can go out a different route. You're not obviously able to go um, laterally in terms of being able to put your points into it. You only can work up but thankfully you can work diagonally in order to pick a certain loadout that you prefer so it's heavily customizable in terms of what you enjoy using with that person in mind the same thing goes for the skill tree which is a very vast system it looks very complicated at face value when you you know scroll around and get a sense of it all but once you start to realize how it works it's pretty simple and there's only two things to really pay attention to First thing when you get down here is you get a specific pathway that you get to choose from. Every character in the game has this same pathway. The perks that appear and the attributes that appear are different. So once you pick one direction, then the other routes will close out. So you're not able to double back end, go through another way just to kind of pick up a certain, you know, build if you will. But once you start to go through a certain route, then eventually the tree will start to branch out into different pathways and you can actually choose which way you want. You'll get a bit of a preview of what perks or attributes are available before you actually make that choice. So you do get to pick and choose. And then eventually once you reach to the max level of level 10 for the character, then you'll reach the end of said tree. Now the beauty with it is the respect system also applies to this tree system as well. So if I respect all of my points, I can start from the beginning and then you'll notice that I'm able to just start to put points into my tree and then it's going to build out you know the idea of what perks are available now of course like i said before if i pick one pathway the other pathway isn't available to me but it's usually valuable to figure out whether or not you want to continue to go down this pathway and you can respect your points at any time and you whatever points you were spending 
you put them back in your total and then you can start over again and you can do this unlimitedly as well it's pretty important to keep this in mind because if you wanted to play one character but then let's say you wanted to respect your points and then check out another character and go to anna you can use those same points to work on anna and then be able to check out where her skill tree looks like and that'll allow you to really maximize your capability. So in a simple nutshell, once you maximize one character's skill tree, you've essentially maximized all of them. However, of course, you can only pick one character at a time. And that also applies to the family as well. I can take the points that I would have put on Connie or Anna and then come to Hitchhiker here and then do the same thing and work on the same points. The skill points that are used are always spread across all the characters in your game. So the more you play it, the more you're able to really just put down those points for being able to pick and choose the build that you want to utilize for the character you want to use for the gameplay that you're trying to put into perspective for that so of course that being said on the killer side too they have their own particular trees they're all unique the same rules apply they also are able to modify their abilities and that's going to really start to showcase a lot of value for both sides once people start playing this game and they have very high level characters that have they've been playing for a while the game's dynamic will definitely change at a significant rate because of the fact that certain perks as they get stronger their affectation also increases such as this one here where your stamina consumption is reduced by five percent when you're carrying a blood vial that's more than 50 percent full so if i have a total of 100 blood points i can carry with this character if i have 50 of it then my consumption goes down by five percent but as i use this perk in a match this will give me experience points that i can use to make this perk stronger and this rule of thumb applies to every perk in the game granted there's not an easy way to acquire every single perk you are able to at least work on it and that also retains those points value as well so if i were to pick up say this perk here you'll pay for that and if i put my time and effort into it to like level two but then i respect it then this perk will stay level two so you don't really lose any value if you wanted to respect the points that you put into a character and try and test out a different character as well it's really nice to know that you get to basically continue your progress when you're working on certain characters which does become important because as you queue into a game let's say that you know, since it's a four versus three scenario, if Connie, Leland, Anna, and Sunny are all taken, but I want to play Anna and I'm playing Connie, then if this person hasn't readied up yet, I'm actually able to ask them to swap characters with me. Since I'd have all my points on Anna, I'd want to take advantage of that. And people are pretty nice about being able to, you know, let you play the character that you're choosing to want to play. I really do appreciate that uh, from the community perspective. The only small downside though is that if you are working on the skill tree usually the the lobbies that you get put into the match will start in three minutes if you get queued into it sometimes the timer is lower depending on how early you enter it or late and sometimes if you are kind of put in a situation where you're only able to play leland but you've never played leland before then you know to take your points out of connie when someone's already playing connie just isn't possible so you might end up going into a lobby with a level zero Leland, and then you have to just work with whatever you have at base kit. So it will be nice in the future, which I'm sure that they'll add in the future as well, where you can kind of speed progress a character from the start and then just immediately pick a certain perk or a certain tree route and then you'll be able to get everything that kind of just lines up to that point that way you can spend little time having to kind of click and choose because once you start clicking and choosing you'd have to keep on doing this um very frequently just so that you can start to get the route that you want because once you start becoming familiar with the character that you're playing then it's going to be really quick and easy to just keep following the same pathway since you're going to be seeing a lot of the similar perks and attribute points that might be there the random perks might be a little bit different but you're still going to be taking the time to go through the same route so to be doing this while you're in a lobby and trying to queue in and people are waiting for the game to start you know they're going to have to wait on you specifically to finish leveling up your character because then once you actually work on finishing this out then you have to go into your loadout and take your points and put them in and then you'll have to take the perks you want to use and apply these perks as well and then even with the grandpa ability and then just queue into the game so there being a way to do this quicker with little effort will definitely be very welcomed once they add that as a future update for sure one thing i really appreciate 
about the game's system as well is that you're not able to pick the same character and have everyone play that one particular character and go into a match. So it does offer a sense of balance since only one player is able to play Connie versus one person being able to play Leland and Anna and Julie. And the same thing will be applied once we start adding more characters to the roster because then there's gonna be a wide variety of people to choose from and that'll also determine the play style that'll be applied to the game. One thing that's also important to keep in mind is that before you actually queue into the game, you're going to be aware of who you're going up against on both sides. So if I queue in as a victim into a match, I'm going to see which members of the family I will be going up against. This will allow me to formulate my plan about how to counteract each person. Since people's powers are different in terms of their application, some characters might work more effectively than others. Julie, for example, here, her ability allows her to decrease the consumption of her stamina since she's a, an endurance-based character, but she also has a sense of stealth since her ability allows her to reduce stamina consumption while running, but also she can't be tracked by people you, during the ability being active. So Johnny here, who's a character that can track your footprints if he catches whiff of them, he'll be able to follow you. Julie actually serves as a very strong counter to Johnny, but she's the only person who has this ability. So it's not like the ability can be shared between different characters, which I really appreciate because there isn't a way to have the same power be used by everybody in the game. So you have to be very meticulous about what character you're using and who you're going up against because that'll either give you a very big advantage or give you a significant disadvantage. And on top of that, the same thing can be applied to the family members. Knowing that you're going to be playing a certain killer, Bubba or Leatherface is always a requirement in the game, which makes sense because obviously it's his game, but some people on the family side may not be the biggest fan of wanting to play Leatherface. So in the event that you have someone playing Cook, Hitchhiker, or Johnny, you know, one of these three players are going to have to just chalk it up and play Leatherface since he's a required character to be used in the game. Since his chainsaw is necessary for destroying the environment and also kind of giving the necessary start for the game since it always cues in with him, you know, taking out whichever member of the family um, is there. And then with the victims in the basement, you know, whichever of the four that are chosen, the fifth one that's not being played is sacrificed, if you will, to Leatherface. And that's what's going to start the game. So usually Leatherface starts by himself in the basement versus the four victims, and then the family members are at top. So it does give everyone a sense of preparation. Victims have to formulate their strategy of being able to go up against the family. Families that are not Leatherface have to kind of prepare themselves defensively for the top side to prevent things like the generator working and to make sure that the doors are locked and kind of set up their traps and really just be prepared for when the inevitable happens because technically it's not possible for them to escape without at least going upstairs from the basement area in order to actually find either, you know, multiple exit routes. And we'll definitely discuss that further once we queue into the actual gameplay. Last but not least, I think that this game has so much potential. The one thing to keep in mind though, is that it's going to be focusing heavily on the first movie. People have been wondering if it's gonna be using the sequels or even the next generation film. If you don't know about that, there's like a female other face. Um, she's not technically part of the original 74 movie, so there's no chance of seeing anybody uh, from the sequel movies put into the game. That being said though, the company does have the licensing for the original film and they are working with the original writers to introduce new victims and family members to the game that will keep the game feeling as if like they were already there from the start. A good example of this is uh, Johnny and Sissy here because they are two original characters that were written and designed by the original writer, but they were never into the actual first movie. Of course, that being said, the trio was originally Hitchhiker, Cook, and Leatherface. And so to be getting new family members that still feel original and true to the movie while still being different is a really refreshing welcome to the game, knowing that the variety for it is very expansive. So for the customization facts of it all, there's so much to come. And we haven't even had a chance to really go into cosmetics since there is so much of that, of course, on the way as well. So I really appreciate this game's customization and all the varieties that are being introduced. And there's so much more that has to be unlocked and determined for this as well. Coming into the victims side of the game here, I love that the introduction for this always starts you out in the basement and you're essentially trying to figure out your means of escape. This game puts very, very heavy emphasis on the victim side that you're not supposed to make noise. 
it's very important that you stay quiet because the more noise that you make, the more risk you put yourself at being exposed by the family for them to be able to track you. Now, of course, because the game is still new, it hasn't been out for all too long, there is a lot of information that you can gather from being able to navigate this basement. There's a lot of interactables. There's a lot of different places you can maneuver. The basement side of this map is extremely large. And at this moment in time, the game usually starts off with Leatherface taking out the fifth survivor and basically making it the 1v4 introduction to the game. Normally there is a criteria required for the game to open up and expand the map for a lot of the other players since the other two family members are upstairs and they can't come down to the basement since it hasn't technically been opened until now where the grandpa would awaken. The grandpa awakening is a requirement in order for the map to open up for the victims to be able to go upstairs while also being able to have the other family members come downstairs. So until that actually happens, you're not able to make any moves without at least taking some kind of risk to escape the basement. Now, the game usually has a time clock of about 20 to 25 minutes, I want to say. If you look at the right, the heart health that's there is kind of like the ticking clock for the entire game. Every member of the victim side has that same heart rate level and it decreases at the same pacing as well. Normally, what happens is it starts at red, and as it diminishes, you'll see it kind of form a little bit of a yellow side. Once that goes down to the very bottom, then eventually everyone's heart condition will reach that worst condition case scenario, and then they're required to, on their final minutes, to escape because the HP that all of the victims have will go down faster knowing that that meter has reached its very limit there's no way to actually recover it higher it's forced to be decreased at a slow pace now there is another condition that will forcibly turn the heart into the gray state where you are the last victim left in the game and that can be either done whether three people escape or if three people don't make it you're forcibly the last victim standing it'll let you see the aura of the family members and then you'll also be able to figure out your plan of escape so this game really puts a lot of emphasis on being able to have a very fast gameplay, but you're also under a time crunch because you still have to figure out a way to escape. And the biggest appreciation that I have for this game is that it's not just a one door objective in terms of being able to escape. There are multiple interactives. There are multiple methods of escaping. There's normally one exit in the basement that usually is powered up through like a fuse and there are about two to three exits that are on the opposite sides of the map as well, so that they're not really pressured to just holding out on one side. So even if you have three members of the family just defending the top side, if the victims can play their cards right, they actually have a method of being able to go back down into the basement and escape through that method. So it does give a very strong sense of fairness in being able to escape and also create this very wide sense of unpredictability because they have to work very hard to figure out where you might be located. That being said though, there are a plethora of perks that the family can choose from that will allow them to either gather information on your whereabouts or even be able to put a lot of damage on you and that will allow you to you know, survive a little bit less often than you wish that you could. But that being said, if you are able to play your cards right, then you'll put yourself in a very good position where you're able to just easily sneak by them. Now, once we get upstairs topside, you'll get a very strong sense of the environment because it does have this very, very powerful sense of stealth that is incorporated to the game. Now, that being said though, the victims still need to be quiet once they get up there but the family have free reign of being able to navigate anywhere that the victims also can. So just because you might be hiding in a bush, that doesn't give the family member any reason to not go further investigate where you may or may not be. Since if they get any whiff of you being in that area, if they take a swing at you, they'll be well aware that you're there and then they'll just completely work together to hunt you down. One thing that also gets underlooked a bit with this game is that this game does offer communication across the board between both victims and the family. Obviously they can't talk to each other because you can't talk to your opponents, but you can talk to your teammates. And that's really important in the later ends of the game, especially because you have to actually figure out where somebody might be located 
or if you're investigating a certain area, turns out no one's there, you have every reason to go figure out elsewhere where they might be located. The grandpa becomes a very pivotal uh, method of really giving you the check on whether or not you're able to be quiet or not in this game. Again, a lot of people really want to treat this as a speed run, you know, get in, get out sort of game, but you're really not supposed to do that. It's only going to get you killed. And I've learned that the hard way for sure, knowing that if I am in the midst of trying to escape very quickly and, and I think that I don't have any time, that just means that I wasn't going, you know, quietly enough to be able to escape. I really think that it's important to keep in mind that when you are able to play the game slowly and you also have the option of playing it solo, you can figure out your own method of escape. It's really complicated to be able to escape when you're constantly surrounded by three people who are trying to catch you. So if you put yourself in a situation where you're forcibly being cornered by three of them, you have zero chances of escaping because you are able to use a bone scrap in order to kind of defend yourself in the moment and you kind of have like a mashing interactive game on who can tap the fastest but if you're in combat with one person there's no reason for you to not be swarmed by the other two and if they attack you while you're struggling with one other member of the family then that's pretty much a guaranteed kill because you can just take damage from the other two while you're in struggle so it's very important to just be very quiet and to slowly make your way to the escape that being said of course, you are able to communicate with your team or not at all. I personally am a solo player, so I choose to work with people if they're working towards my same objective. And the beauty behind that is you're not critically required to utilize your team for escaping. You have the full reign ability, as you'll see, that you can do this by yourself if you just play your cards right. There's no reason for you to immediately think of a way to rush out of there. Because, again, you still have to deal with the fact that there are three people manually searching the premises for you. And they have the grandpa who will do a sound check that if you do make any kind of noise or move, then you're automatically detected by him. And then you have to figure out a way to escape or not at all. Putting further emphasis on the victim side of the game, like I said, being able to play the game solo is obviously important because you are in control of your own actions and your own movement. Whether you move slow or get caught in a trap, you obviously have the opportunity to make and break your own plays. But in the case scenario that you are able to work with a teammate, if you have one person who's able to work on turning off the battery to actually prevent the floor from being electrified and have another person open the door that is currently locked, right? You give yourself that cooperative opportunity to have two people work towards the same goal, which I think is very important because you are able to work co connectively to actually escape faster. But of course, if one person makes a mistake, then you both run the risk of being able to not make it alive. That being said though, it is so important that you formulate your own plan. Normally, it's really easy to tell yourself whether or not you want to work with your teammate because you're not required to utilize your teammate's actions in order to escape the game. You are able to, granted it is a four versus three team based game, it is very easy to just work on your own and kind of be like a lone ranger and escape in your own method. Because if there are teammates that you have that are making too much noise or putting in too much work towards something and then getting exposed for it, they have every reason to be on one side of the map and you can take that to your advantage and work on another place that might give you an advantage in being able to escape. However, if there is this odd phenomenon that there is too much happening in this one side of the map, that doesn't really take away the family's perspective of wanting to go investigate the other areas of the map because there is a chance that there might be somebody else elsewhere. So what I will say in conclusion is that playing the victim side of the game is incredibly scary. It requires risk and it's a real strong adrenaline of just like having that fight or flight response. I think that it's incredibly rewarding to be able to actually utilize the environment as a means of escape. And we haven't even touched on all the remaining parts of the environment as well. There are doors that have latches that you can close and then that kind of creates a, a bit of space between you and the family to be able to escape. And going with Leatherface, you can either chainsaw that door open or have the smaller members of the family just barge the door open and kind of bust through it. And then that door lock gets broken. 
Uh, additionally, there are different types of lockers that are addressed in this game that you can utilize. There's one that has like a freezer box in it, which if you are in a freezer box for too long, you will actually freeze to death if you hide in there for so long. Additionally, there are, you know, closets that are used for like wardrobes that you can hide in. And, you know, there is a way that they can see you if they kind of peek in it a little bit or if they actually manually open the door and search it. And in this, at least in this map as well, there are car trunks you can hide in. And that'll actually allow you to utilize it as an alternate means of hiding. So this game has so much to explore. And of course, when they do release future DLC that will include new maps, I guarantee that they'll be able to come up with even more innovative ways to add to that stealth mechanic and gameplay and give you new opportunities of being able to play it slow, play it safe and hide uh, without getting caught by the family. So. It's incredibly rewarding, it's incredibly fun, and it's incredibly scary to be playing as the victim side of the game, but it's such a fun experience. And granted, there's only three maps in the game currently, the layout of the maps do change, and the best part is there's different times of day. So it's not like you can come into this map and then play on the daytime, and it's the same layout. You can get this exact same map, and it'll be nighttime, or even dawn or dusk. And that'll actually change how the map feels when you play it. You might actually lose track of positioning a little bit sometimes because you might realize that, oh, you know, this place looks so different at night versus the daytime. You'll actually get that feeling. And it's really appreciated to be able to actually have that feeling knowing that it's only three maps in the game. But there's so much replayability for it despite that. So it's a lot of a fun times just to be able to really put that into perspective. So I really appreciate them putting in this time and work and effort to grant that there is three maps there's four different times of the day and that literally creates 12 different maps if you will and there will be more to come so i'm really looking forward to that of course coming into the family side of the game we have leatherface here i personally as somebody who doesn't really see myself playing this game from the perspective of the family or the killer side if you will i love playing as a family member uh so far leatherface has grown on me and again, that emphasis of having a 3v4 scenario really changes the dynamic of the game because of the, how large the map is. If it was just a one versus four scenario, it really wouldn't feel like you have a chance of being able to find four people since there's no real easy way to track them because if they are quiet and stealthy, it becomes very, very difficult to figure out where they may or may not be. But with that in mind, because it is a 3v4 scenario, you pretty much have a very specific goal and focus in mind that you want to take advantage of with the character that you're utilizing. Granted, again, Leatherface is a requirement to use in the game. It has to be because it's his game. I would like to think in the future that they do create some way of there being a different character that is can be used to play the game and start the matchup because you literally can't start the match if there isn't a Leatherface right now. But if we did get some different kind of character, it would be cool to think that we can basically choose between one or the other in order to start the game. I wouldn't want them to necessarily give us the three small characters to play with. I would find it more valuable to play with at least one person who has a weapon, like a chainsaw of some sort. That way they can be destructive. Since the environment requires destruction in general for the actual play style to be applied for the family and the victim members, it just makes sense to have there be at least one. Now, the grandpa is a really cool functionality that essentially makes it a real 4v4 game, but since the grandpa is an NPC, it is technically still a 3v4. The grandpa pretty much is when the level meter on the right fills up, the power and strength of grandpa's detection will, will increase. The simple rule is that the victims are not supposed to move. And that also includes interactions that require moving. So if there's anything that involves their feet moving, then they are going to be detected by grandpa. So if you are climbing up a ladder, for example, that is a scenario that counts as your aura being detected. Granted, you're not actually performing an animation. You are technically moving and that will you know, generate your aura to be detected by the grandpa. But if you are working on something such as opening a door with a lockpick or trying to find something uh, with like a bone scrap, that doesn't technically count. But as you work on building the grandpa's level, you'll get more powers that are added to it. And there are perks that you can use with the grandpa in mind as well that will actually make him even stronger. So once he hits level two, there's usually a delay in how often he actually activates his sonar ability. Then eventually when you reach level four, then even if you're hiding inside of like a bush, 
you can still be detected by the grandpa's sonar. Once you reach the maximum level, then no matter where you are, you will always be detected by the grandpa. Now, of course, there is a, an effective counter to this as well. The victims can hit the grandpa and stun him and then immobilize him. It'll temporarily put him out, but it'll also decrease the level. So it does become a pivotal moment for the victims to actually want to interact with the grandpa, because if the family takes advantage of how strong the grandpa can become, then it really goes south very quickly for the victims since they need to try and take advantage as much as possible of being quiet. So having that grandpa's radar decrease becomes a real pain point for the victims to keep in mind of so that they don't get caught by the family. But it's also a pain point for the family to keep in mind of because they don't want the grandpa to be interrupted so that his power is always active and running. Now, what I do also love about this game is that, again, I don't have any reason to just pick one route and then just keep on defending it the entire time. I do need to be very careful about where I go who I play with and what information I can gather from the mobility or from the destruction that I'm causing in the map because that's gonna allow me to really get an idea of what I need to do to catch the victims. Now, I think that the one real downside to being able to play the family is that, I mean, the simple answer to it is that there's just not enough members of the family, but that's something that will be fixed, of course, very quickly and with the time and age. Uh, getting five to choose from and then being able to play three is very nice and very comforting but in that long run when we end up having you know 10 and then there's three to choose from because the victims know who they get to go up against before the game starts it already allows them to set up a strategy against the family the the same rules don't really get applied for the family versus the victims because they all have to complete the same objective, but just how they go about that objective does change. So if I were to go up against Connie, you know, I know that she'll be stealthier and she'll want to play quieter and she's going to want to find lockpicks and then open doors very quickly without being caught. But going up against Leland, it's his job to actually want to battle me and at least keep me busy because he has that shoulder tackle and he's the only real victim who's able to effectively combate, combat against the victims and that will either sign him up for a very strong sense of danger or he might be able to just use it as an opportunity to give everyone a chance to escape there is a lot of replayability on both sides of the game and i really enjoy that i don't want to necessarily make any comparisons to any other games that are also asymmetrical horror games however i have played a very fair share of them and this is the only one that i played where i had an extremely a high amount of fun playing the killer side if you will uh, I don't think it's not, it's not just because of the fact that it's like a cooperative experience. It is welcoming to know that that is what it is, but it's also just a lot of fun to be able to run around with a chainsaw or to sneak around the map and then really just think about what's going on with whom and where, and then just be able to just run a terror around the entire game. So I do think that it's so much fun. And the best part is too, when they do introduce more maps, that's going to only add to the replayability because it's going to be a new place to figure out, a new map to understand and to learn, and they'll most likely even be new objectives as well, because for them to have just so much interactions in this game really showcases the amount of time and effort that they put into making this game stand like a shining star in comparison to its competitors. So I really do appreciate that we get to enjoy an experience like this. And I think on top of that, too, the most important thing for me playing as a family member that adds that sense of balance is I need to actually use my senses to understand where they are, what they're doing, how do I find them? And I can communicate with my team as well as the family to actually understand like, oh, you know, we saw Leland go into the basement and, you know, it, there's no reason for us to all go into the basement and try and find him because we want to try and take out everybody as we can. But there still is a chance that somebody might get behind us and we won't even realize it because they're playing so quiet and so stealthy and they don't want anything to do with us. Like I said, this game puts very high emphasis on having the family just go on a hunt to find these people. But it also puts heavy emphasis on the victim side where you're not supposed to be caught by us. If you can figure out a way to sneak around us, then for us to run around and kind of focus our emphasis on making grandpa's sonar stronger kind of it gives you like an exposure to our play style as well as our strategy so once we put that into perspective then you'll be able to easily escape us too so i like that 
the extremes of escaping and, and losing is so high for both ends. And it's not just like a one-sided game. I really appreciate that it can be an easy game for just having somebody escape or somebody getting caught just because of the actions that you choose to make for yourself or for your team to make that kind of decision. So all in all, this game has been an extremely fun experience so far. I love this game so much. It's definitely going on like the upper shelves of just really phenomenal and fun gameplay. And, you know, I don't really think that there's anything that uh, has been an issue for me so far in my play style for the game. I just really have enjoyed everything the game has had to offer, which is insane because considering there's only five family members, five victims and three maps, that doesn't sound like a lot, but I haven't bothered to notice it enough where it's seemed to be an issue because there's still parts of this game that I haven't even had the chance to navigate. And same thing goes for the characters that are playable. There's many characters I haven't played. There's many perks I haven't used and I haven't leveled the game up enough to even understand what I like for characters and perks and builds and everything that comes inclusive with that. So there's a lot to explore in this game and I think that it's totally worth checking out all the way through. Definitely buy this game at full price value. It's totally worth it. I think it's like 40 bucks. It, it's literally worth every single penny. And you'll definitely have a really fun time playing this, whether you're on your own or with friends. And I think the community also collectively will agree with you that if you do get your hands on this game, you won't be disappointed in any way. So hopefully you get a chance to play this game. I highly recommend it. I can't emphasize that enough. It's probably my favorite asymmetrical horror game in a very, very long time. And I think that you need to go get this game as soon as possible because there's already over a million people playing it. You gotta be one of us. So hopefully you guys enjoy the game. Really let me know what you guys think. I'd love to get people's thoughts about both sides and you know, kind of what's the evolution to come for this game. They have discussed that this game is not going anywhere anytime soon since the original team that worked on the movie is working on the game as well. So we are going to be getting a ton of content to come and it's only gonna be more exciting from that point forward. So. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys later.